What are we talking about today? The band of the red hand. So I love this. So today is going to be part one of a two-part series. We need to go back in time a little bit to talk about the band of the red That's hand. That's my favorite thing to do. So if we want to know about them, we have to kind of talk a little bit about the Trolloc Wars and why the Trolloc Wars happened. And mm-hmm. therefore, that'll kind of give everyone the understanding of why something like the Band of the Red Hand was even needed. Yeah. So just a yeah. little disclaimer. This episode will be spoiler free. It's just going to be lore and background stuff. I so love that. Going back in time, so no heavy spoilers here. And yeah, the Band of the Red Hand, the legendary fighting unit from the Netherin. Let's go. I'm I'm down. I'm down. Where do you want to start? So, if we're looking at the timeline, I want to start off with Ishamayel because okay. we're going to go back to the to the Age of Legends and to the breaking of the world. So, after sealing the war, Luz Theron Telamond, you know, traps all the Forsaken, and it's commonly thought that Ishamayel wasn't fully sealed mm-hmm. in there, so he's able to kind of touch the world and I some also, havoc that way. Did you did you read where it's also suspected that he may not have been part of that initial closing of the boar at all? Like he may have somehow escaped from being trapped with the rest of the Forsaken at the time that Luce Theron closed the boar. And that's how read- he's been able Well, I didn't read that. What it says in Robert Jordan's World of the Wheel of Time is that... I wish I had that. Sorry. Is that he was partially trapped. Yeah, that's what I've always thought, too. One foot out. Like, he was physically trapped, but metaphysically still able to... Launch himself. Yeah. Yeah, out into the world. Yeah, that was actually why I wanted to bring it up, was because I had never... I had never seen that before and like I know you had said like how is he capable of like influencing the world around him and so I was kind of trying to dig a little bit more into Ishamayel because oh my gosh there's so much about him and I came across the idea that like there's another hypothesis out there that it may have taken longer before he was more completely trapped by the Mm -hmm. the prison that had been established yeah there's also a scholar named aron son of malon son of sanar i'm guessing this is an ogier it It would have to be it would have to (laughs) be and he was born in 50 ab so 50 years after the breaking and he wrote all of these diaries and letters and he was in close contact with Aes Sedai at the time. Uh-huh. And he claimed that there were actually sightings and encounters of Ishamayel even after yeah. he was supposed to be sealed. Yeah. So many didn't believe this guy's findings until much later when they were conducting like these dark friend interviews and they were like, <laughs> yeah, like he speaks to me, Ishamael. Yeah, like he gives I'm... me instructions. <laughs> what do you think those dark friend interviews look like if you're being interviewed by an Ogier? Would you like would you like some tea? Well, this Can I make you comfortable? This wasn't by him. This was this happened oh, okay. way later. So Oh, okay, after okay. This, after this Aaron had died is when the dark friend interviews happened yeah so like a lot of people didn't even believe this guy's findings and they were like okay like sure probably not and then like it comes out hundreds of years later that these dark friends are like shamayel speaks to me i'm following you now cool awesome Ooh. Mm -hmm -hmm. it's shamayel shamayel this whole reason we're talking about shamayel is to kind of prep people to understand how the Trolloc Wars might have happened. Mm -hmm. And it's because of someone like Ishamayel having influence that these hordes of Trollocs start pouring out of the Blight again. The world at this time 
they had gone through the breaking, and then mm-hmm. after that, there was the war of, or first was the war of power, and then the breaking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They had all these troubles, and finally, when they reach a time of peace and the nations start rebuilding, they get these nations together and they're like, hey, we're going to sign this pact. Mm-hmm. And in 209 after the breaking, mm-hmm. then we have these 10 nations. And they signed this, I kind of want to call it a treaty, just to mm-hmm. protect one another because mm-hmm. they know like what is out there. They've seen a lot of troubled times and chaos and they weren't going to be too relaxed just as soon as things start to look good again. <laughs> well, and I'm also thinking the queen who's given credit for really pushing for this is Mabrium something Shreed. I know it's in our in our notes, but if she this was is the only Tavirin one, so yeah, suspected Tavirin, suspected yeah. Tavirin. But if she's 200 years old, she could have been around during the breaking given the fact that like i mean i didn't check her her date of birth or anything but Mm -hmm. i mean she probably more than a lot of other people may have a a, like a living memory in a way that others may not have just a thought yeah i mean that's just something like in our history like people veterans that have gone through major wars and uprisings yeah they're a lot more cognizant of what can rehappen, like what can go yes. on again. Yep. Yeah. So if we jump back to the Trolloc Wars, this all starts happening around a thousand years after the breaking. We've got the Trollocs coming in. We've got these huge armies of people that have sworn themselves to the shadow. So just everyday people actually mm-hmm. like decided hey we're gonna go fight for the bad guys do, do, and... do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they've got like merdral leading trollic hordes and and there's jakar and dreadlords. what are the other and dreadlords yep like the there's... dreadlords are always the most scary to me because it's they're just other channelers but they're fighting on the other side yeah so. yeah well and the trollic wars took place after like 800 years more or less of peace like borders had stayed stable and people were like willingly looking out for each other because there wasn't any dire threat Mm -hmm. and really once the the trollocs started descending it fractured them it which i mean i think kind of makes sense but they Mm -hmm. had this pact to be united and instead of being united they split and that's unfortunate. I just wanted to ask, because when I was looking through, like, the Ten Nations and everything, Arid Hall and Minethrin and maybe, like, Tarvalin seem to be the three main powers of the Ten Nations. Like, they almost feel like the power players that help pull everybody together. Does that, like, did that feel that way for you, too? No, not really. I just okay. felt like it's the focus is on Minethrin far more like in the lore because it affects like some of like the, the, characters the characters that we see later on. So they would like focus more on that or have yeah. a more detailed backstory because these other nations that turned into something else, like some of the borderlands and whatnot, like yeah. We don't spend that much time there. So, like, we're given information, I feel like, based on which characters need backstories. <laughs> oh, okay. that's a good point. That's a good point. Because I was just, like, to me, it just felt like they were the two nations kind of, like, not propping the other nations up, but maybe, like, contributing more in a way. But I think well, you're right. The thing that... I feel like makes Minethrin so much feel like a like a big power in the nations, mm-hmm. in the ten nations, is that when all of this is going to shit, like there was only one nation that really like picked themselves up and was like, This is our duty, like mm-hmm. and none fought the shadow is harshly as Minethrin. Yeah, and I was just, I, I don't know, like I was trying to picture it myself like 
what 350 years of, of fighting war. these wars against like nightmare creatures would look like and these are people that did not have a respite at all for generations yeah. so you think that they would probably be like very battle hardened yeah yeah and i would definitely say there would be a tremendous amount of psychological damage and adjustment like as you said becoming battle hardened like there's a very different perspective in the borderlands for Mm -hmm. what the cycle of life is what is expected of everyone because at any time anyone along the borderlands can be attacked by a horde of trollocs so they live with it they live with it in a very different way that makes all of them feel kind of badass whether they're like blacksmiths or trained soldiers or a seamstress like it seems like Mm -hmm. anyone who lives in the borderlands could pick up anything and fight for their lives like that's what they that's what they know life is short and precious and harsh and grab it while you can so maybe maybe it was 250 years of that because maybe it took like 100 years to like make that transition from Mm -hmm. what the fuck to we need to be a powerful force we need to be able to defend ourselves if we need to right so they're so dedicated to their code yeah and i feel like this is a safety mechanism for their culture for their people yeah in the same way that when we hear about manethrin it's like we pick ourselves up we rebuild we stick together we get things done and i kind of like how there is that similarity somewhat between the manethrin crowd and then like the borderlands crowd because even much later on like they have their quirks I guess yeah yeah and you could kind of see that if you're a nation that's constantly just being assaulted in yeah wars and battles in Trolloc war time everyone was completely overrun like mm-hmm. these armies were so much greater than, than on anything the side of the humans yeah so they had to re- like completely restructure their way of combat like they had mm-hmm. to invent new ways of fighting yeah because they were completely overrun so there was I forgot just, about that yeah so it's just i don't know like they started their own like new warfare tactics because of this yeah so everything had to change and everyone had to repurpose and find any way that they could to having this combined joint military effort. So no matter who you were or what you did, you had to support this endeavor. And I think like if I look back at some of the lore and stories and stuff, they're supposed to be having a movie, I guess, three oh, it's oh yeah 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 age, and it's i thought it was age gonna of be legends fun. time uh-huh. supposedly but they haven't really Ooh. explained like it's supposed to be a trilogy i guess i would love it if it'd be like age of legends uh breaking, breaking of the of world, world trollic wars. wars yes Ugh. like that would be oh, really that'd be cool, cool if they went in I guess chronological order and yeah just kind of like did the whole story up to I don't know maybe the fall of Manethrin or something like that yeah I think that's like I don't know that would be such a cool place to like p- end the tale I guess yeah it would I mean especially since like after this happens things are kind of quiet for a while you know like th- there isn't another big like another big battle or anything that like kind of sweeps through the Westlands after I this? I would have to look it up. I don't remember when Arthur Hawkwing's wars were. That's, but... that's what I was wondering about too. Because yeah, that would be, I would love that. There's so much lore to the Wheel of Time that you could turn into so many cool movies. Like, ugh, I would just love that. Yeah. Arthur Hawkwing was from the Free Years, so <laughs> War of Power, Breaking of the World, Trolloc Wars, and then 
Arthur Hawkwing's era where there was a lot of warring between nations. War but not... and consolidation. Yeah. I was talking about kind of repurposing like everyone's trades, I guess, mm, to supporting mm-hmm. the war effort. To being a war and effort. What, yeah. And what I thought was really cool is that even musicians were like, oh, you're a musician. Now you will like play the drums and lead an <laughs> army. And, right. Like, even these people that had no fighting ability whatsoever, they had to find a place in the war. And so they would either be playing the drums and then as the fighting was going on they would be dragging injured soldiers away to help out and then like every healer or hedge doctor or wisdom that was alive like had to join up and help save these people after all of these battles Mm -hmm. so it's just it's really interesting like i think that i think that there would be a lot there to make into a movie like there's so much there i just think that would be really cool and camp followers people that would be responsible for like taking care of things you could have some sort of like uh servant servant spy network like eyes and ears kind of thing throughout it as well because of course it's a war and you never quite know what's going to happen where so there's a lot that can be built on top of what's already been built there that would make it really mm-hmm. intriguing and fun. Maybe yeah, I just have a thing for spycraft. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the, what it is. A lot of the channelers of this time, they were all Aes Sedai, so even like queens of these nations were usually Aes Sedai. So right? like they were helping out too most of the time. So it's not just like the men went off and fought. Like mm-hmm. everyone had to be working as a unit and working together yeah and later on we see what happens when someone isn't doing their part Mm -hmm. and i guess we can say i won't get too far into it but some nations kind of hesitated in jumping in and helping out and at this point, they relied on all of their neighbors as allies for support, which, I mean, it's a good thing and bad thing to have allies, but if you can't 100% depend on them, you're screwed. Yeah, so, and it was fear-based. Like, for, for the people who chose to kind of keep their armies back, they were afraid of being attacked. Well, some people didn't want to join just out of not liking someone so like there were nations yeah spite there were nations that needed help that sent out calls that we need help and some just said "Mm -mm." (laughs) not today so out of all of these nations the one that stood up and was this overwhelming ally to be you know feared and respected and praised was Manetheran and they always handled this responsibility with sheer honor and duty and they were the first to be like let's go (laughs) yeah yeah and I pulled a quote here and it says some handled the responsibility with honor. Such were the fiercely brave warriors of Manetheran fighting under the Red Eagle banner so fervently that over two centuries that they had came to be known as a thorn in the Dark One's foot, the bramble to his hand, and Manetheran herself as the sword that could not be broken. And mm. I just love that quote because it kind of sets the stage for the band of the red hand i'm just excited about like digging into an elite fighting force mm-hmm. on our on our next time through we've dug into it just a little bit in in the past i think there is like some historical influences for the band of the red hand as well that are kind mm-hmm. of fun to to talk about so yeah so next week we're going to actually talk about the band of the red hand and hopefully this has been a good way to get people to kind of like see the world at the time for what it was and why you would need an elite military fighting force so yeah yeah we'll leave it at that and next week we will see you then yay